The Denver Broncos made a move this week to solidify their offensive tackle depth, which was previously a concern for the Broncos. Is it enough, though? We discuss that and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in, making Locked On Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. And shout out to all the everydayers out there. Make sure you subscribe or follow on YouTube for free or wherever you get your podcast so you never miss out on an episode as soon as it's made available. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter. For Mile High Sports. Joined alongside, as always, by my co host and my good friend, Sarah Bettinger. He's the site expert over there, predominantlyorange.com. And w- last week, we did an episode talking about hey, the Broncos' biggest positional weaknesses are the offensive line and defensive line depth in terms of offensive tackle and defensive tackle. Well, you know what? In one day on Tuesday in Dove Valley, the Broncos rectified that a little bit. They brought back a familiar face on the offensive line, specifically at offensive tackle. In Cam Fleming, I mean, Sarah, let's talk about this. When the news came across, how did you initially feel about this move here for the Broncos? Because you and I have both talked about it. The concern and Broncos country share the same concern as well. Depth at offensive tackle prior to the signing was very questionable, very shaky at best. It was, Cody, and I don't have a notepad, an actual sheet of paper here, but I was just writing down, just mocking some notes up on my phone there, just like the, the Broncos were listening to the episode of the show feeling like, okay, what are Sarah and Cody saying? What are the the listeners of Lockdown <laughs> Broncos saying about what we need for this team? Let's go out and make it happen. No, I, I love it. And I love to see bringing back Cam Fleming, right? That's a great move for the Broncos, an incentive-based deal for Fleming, who played both right tackle and left tackle last year for the Broncos. So, I mean, swing, 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 baby, from the tables of my heart, right? That's what we're doing with Cam Fleming. He's the swing tackle for the Denver Broncos. And he's probably Cody, in my opinion, at least based on what we saw last year, I would say he's up there among the best swing tackles in the game, capable of starting, capable of playing multiple positions. He's a, he's also played guard in his career. So we know Cam Fleming can do a lot. I've come a long way, Cody. When I started off on this podcast, I was sitting here talking every single day. I felt like about how Cam Fleming was a waste of a roster spot. He's not going to play. He's not going to contribute. He's not going to do anything. Well, here we are a couple of years later. He's one of the longer tenured players on the team now. He was there in 2021, 2022, now back for 2023. The deal, according to Tom Pelissero, Cody, worth up to $4 million. So be interesting to see kind of what the overall details of it are and what he's getting in terms of guaranteed money. But my guess is this is not a, hey, let's see if you make the roster in training camp. This is more of a, you're on the roster, you're the swing tackle, and if you play, you have a chance to really get some cash in your bank account. That's the impression that I got initially with this deal. It's like, hey, he's not going to come in and compete for you know a roster spot. He's going to be the main backup option to Garrett Bowles and to Mike McGlinchey, who obviously got you know a massive deal to come to Denver in the offseason. And then I think also we should probably throw out a, another guy out there that also has potential, right? That could be another option at tackle behind Cam Fleming in terms of you know being maybe a guy who could be a valuable swing player as well. And that is Isaiah Prince, who was signed to a futures contract a little bit earlier this offseason, has prior starting experience with the Cincinnati Bengals. I mean, if you have these two guys, and let's say Prince maybe turns out the way that maybe the Broncos hope for, you have two guys that could back up Bowles and McGlinchey because he, the the unfortunate reality of the game, how physical it is, we saw Bowles go down with the injury last year. Mike McGlinchey has had some injuries in his past. Even Cam Fleming has had some injuries in his past. And, of course, Prince has had injuries in his past. So I, I think it's safe to say when we talk about players, and, and I know sometimes we get comments, we get tweets sometimes, well, this guy's injury prone. When you play in the NFL, you're going to get injured. You know, it, Guys who even play 100% of the snaps in the season still do that sometimes banged up. And sometimes, depending on the severity of the injury, all that factors into the equation. But I think that Denver has an opportunity here, not only with Cam Fleming, I feel much more at peace about the Broncos' offensive tackle depth. And then if Isaiah Prince pans out, 
look, there's another good option for you as well. There's some other tackles here as well. We talk about Alex Pacheski, obviously the undrafted rookie for agent out of Illinois. And then you have Demontre Jacobs as well, another undrafted guy. And then you have Christian DeLaro. I mean, all three of these guys don't have any NFL playing experience. DeLaro has been in the league for a year, but has been on practice squads, hasn't had any NFL action. So Denver has some young guys. Look, if they really feel like this guy could be impressive down the road for us, or this guy has some traits we need to develop and sharpen more. Look, you stash them on the practice squad and maybe in a few years, you know, when you run into a situation, because look, it, how, how long is Garrett Bowles going to play here for Denver? We don't know this, right? Because the rumors initially in the offseason that he was on the trade block, then they signed Mike McGlinchey. Okay, Garrett Bowles is not on the trade block. I mean, is Garrett Bowles, is his time potentially up in Denver here in the next couple of seasons? I think it's interesting to ponder. I think it is too. I really do. Garrett Bowles is a guy who's obviously, he was the subject of some trade rumors, right? Earlier in the off season, somebody who, when your cap hit starts to go way, way up because the contract is structured as such, that's kind of when those rumors pick up is when your cap hit goes up, the dead money goes down. Of course, then the conversation changes from, hey, you're a, you're a key player, core player on this team to now, well, the the proof's got to be in the pudding. You got to go out there and play like a top flight player to justify this kind of cap allocation to a guy like Garrett Bowles. And I think that this means firmly, very firmly that the clock is ticking. The the sand timer, are we going to are we going to flip that sand timer back the other way or are we going to let it run out with Garrett Bowles kind of similar to what we saw with Draymond Jones of this past season, right? The Broncos, I mean, we didn't hear of any formal offers that Draymond was made by the Broncos. So it'll be interesting to see if Garrett Bowles gets approached the same way, right? We want to know, is he going to be a fixture at left tackle? And there's question marks about that, right? He was an older rookie coming in. He's already over 30, which is no big deal. You can play tackle into your 30s. It's not a. It's not like a running back position where after 30, it's like, oh man, that guy is like, He's older than my grandpa, basically, in NFL. But it's it's one of those things where, like, okay, you consider all the factors. You just had a major season-ending injury. You're over 30. Your cap hit is way high. you got to go out there if you're Garrett Bowles, and you got to earn another contract, a third NFL contract. I think if he can do that, Cody, that's going to be a game-changer for the way the Broncos are able to construct their roster going forward because it, it erases. It just completely wipes off that need from the table. So, Hopefully Garrett is able to go out there and prove that he can stay healthy again, that he can play at a high level again. And even if he gives the Broncos above average play at left tackle, Cody, I think that's worth maybe giving him that third contract. Let's play a little bit of rapid fire right here, right? Let's ask ourselves the question of Broncos country. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you comment down below. If you're listening in your favorite podcasting provider, make sure you tweet us on Twitter at Cody work NFL at Sarah Bettinger at locked on Broncos comfort level with the Broncos offensive tackle depth. After the Cam Fleming signing, I'm going to give it an eight. That's where I'm feeling right now. I'm confident with that. Uh, and look, the hope is, is you never have to have your backups come in and play, but you need at least one or two guys in totality behind your main starters to step up. And I think Cam Fleming, with his experience as a starter in the NFL, I think it's very valuable. To me, my comfort level went from about maybe a, a two to about an eight here with Fleming. I, I would say mine went from about a six to, I would say, an eight as well, Cody. Feel really good about the starters there. Mike McGlinchey and Garrett Bowles, even like I said, if they give you above average play, that's great. And now you have maybe the best swing tackle in the league in Camp Fleming. I think that comfort level should understandably be high for the Denver Broncos. Broncos country, we want to hear from you on today's episode of the podcast. Just a reminder, you get the show every day for free on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. We're going to continue our conversation here today because we talked about another area of concern we had regarding depth, and that was at the defensive tackle position. The Broncos added yet another player there. Aside from that, who is an undrafted rookie for agent that you need to keep your eye on? You'll get that on today's episode, Locked on Broncos. This episode of the show is brought to you by our friends over there at FanDuel Sportsbook. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. And no, there is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Thousand dollars. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. You wanted defensive line depth for the Denver Broncos. You got defensive line depth for the Denver Broncos. The Broncos brought in Tyler Lancaster, Cody, a former Northwestern Wildcat, 
somebody who was signed, like you mentioned in the opening by the Green Bay Packers coming out of school. And just this past season was picked up by the Las Vegas Raiders, right? Didn't end up getting to play for them, but the Broncos bring him in Cody six foot four, 315 pound defensive lineman here. We talked about this last week on the episode about positions that needed maybe better depth or maybe a higher floor, raise the floor at the position, right? How do you feel about Lancaster coming in and bringing that depth to the Denver Broncos roster? I mean, it's interesting, right? Because we we talked about, I, I would say, Denver's got a lot of depth right there at the position right now, but we're talking about like the lack of experience depth overall. And, and I think Lancaster, I mean, more so maybe than Jonathan Harris, he's probably the only guy that does have prior experience, right? He spent four years with the Green Bay Packers initially coming out as an undrafted rookie free agent. He spent time from 2018 to 2021 bouncing in between the active roster and also the practice squad, where in 2019, he actually saw the most action of his career defensively. And as a nose tackle, look, he, he only had one and a half sacks, and it came in that 2019 season, really his best year as a pro. It's hard, I'm sure, Aaron Donald for defensive tackles to get a lot of sacks. And, and we, you know, we were hoping to see that a little bit with DJ Jones. Obviously, he had a little bit more of an up, uptick in terms of his production there. But overall, it's like, okay, hey, if you if you lose Mike Purcell, look, Mike's in his final year in Denver, right? And after the season, you need to have a plan there. Yes, you have DJ Jones. He's entering year number two. You have guys like Elijah uh, Garcia on the team. You have other guys as well, like Jordan Jackson on the team. Inyoma Uwazarike could play a defensive tackle if you need him to play at that position. But overall, Denver's at a point where they just don't have a lot of experience depth there. And if you lose a guy like Purcell to injury, which, look, he's been tough. He's played through some injuries. He's actually been very durable throughout his time here in Denver. Obviously, you know, a few years ago, he had the Liz Frank injury. That's a very tough injury to overcome, and he's done a tremendous job in being able to do that. Then he had the broken thumb, you know, a couple of years ago when the Broncos had to play the Cleveland Browns on Thursday night football, and it was just he couldn't get his grip there, and that obviously impacted a little bit of his production. But he has maintained his status on this roster since Vic Fangio. He's now through three different coaching staffs. Vic, he's made it through Hackett, and now he's here with Sean Payton. He's going to be a big part, but this is his final year in Denver. Lancaster gives you an option who, you know, I, I don't think it's the sexy name, right? When you look at it on paper, people are like, oh, well, you know, he doesn't have much starting experience. He's played in over 50 games, and he started 10 in his career. So it doesn't mean that he can't play. They can't play a role. You're not bringing this guy in to be a starter. You're being in, you know, bringing him in essentially to be a role player. And I think that's important to highlight here because I think sometimes when a signing happens, everybody looks into it and they say, okay, what's the vision, right? That's how we look at things. What's the vision now for this player? To me, if things pan out with Lancaster, he'll be a depth option that will come in and spell guys like DJ Jones and Mike Purcell if he can stick on the Broncos roster here. I completely agree with you there, Cody. And I think that really what this means to me and what maybe others are seeing here is those young, inexperienced guys that you talked about, right? They now have a guy who has played 59 career NFL games at, you know, on the roster to go ahead and try to beat for a roster spot for snaps, those different types of things. Like it's no longer, okay, which young guy is going to start opposite Zach Allen at defensive end? It's now a matter of, okay, how am I going to actually get snaps with Zach Allen and DJ Jones and Mike Purcell and these other guys here with you know, Tyler Lancaster coming in and now bringing in experience, bringing in somebody who's going to probably come out there and do a really good job to be an undrafted player to get onto the field immediately for the Packers have had a good defense. Let's be honest, in that time frame that he was there, to be able to get on the field a significant portion of the time to me, that indicates this guy is going to make it really hard for young players to come out there and just get snaps. You know, you're not just going to go out and get snaps. You're going to have to go out and earn these snaps. So that's why I really like this move. I don't even know much about Tyler Lancaster, Cody. I, I haven't watched film on him yet or anything to kind of get a feel for. Is he going to play? You know, how often is he going to play? Where is he most effective? Is he good at run stopping this, you know, this, that, and the other? What I'm most excited about is the fact that he has a ton of experience already in the NFL, and that's going to push those younger guys to be better because they're going to have to go out every day at practice and be better than Tyler Lancaster. They're going to have to go out every day at practice and be better than Mike Purcell. If they want to play, you know, that's this the, the Sean Payton era 
is upon us and it's going to be a meritocracy of meritocracy. He talked about that. He talked about the Pierre Thomas story, playing the undrafted free agent over the fourth round pick. He doesn't care about any of that stuff, right? He cares about who's playing well, who's performing. So that gives these guys a little competitive edge. And I like this, this move, the Cam Fleming move. I think it helps all these young guys. It just raised their game going into OTAs and training camp. And I think that's the biggest thing as well, because I think fans want to know what's going on at OTAs. And, and folks, obviously, you know, Thursday's practice at the Centura Health Training Center in Dove Valley, we'll be able to see some things. Now, it's a little bit different. You're not going to get updates as practice is going on. You're going to get updates after practice concludes. So anything that we see, we cannot put out until after practice is officially over. That's a new thing that you're going to see here in terms of media coverage this year with the Broncos. I think it's kind of important to throw that out there. Uh, and so, you know, we'll have you covered. You can follow me on Twitter at Cody work NFL, provide updates whenever I can over there. And obviously daily here, locked on Broncos alongside myself, Sarah Bettinger. Uh, but on top of that, you also look at opportunity, right? And I'm glad that you brought up the, the mention of undrafted, right? Because I think that it kind of segues perfectly into the point that I want to make here. I think if you're a fan right now out in Broncos country, you're listening to this podcast or you're watching it. Who is the undrafted guy you need to keep your eye on, specifically a defensive tackle? And that is P.J. Mustafer out of Penn State and, and Broncos country. The reason I say this, it was early, obviously, in rookie minicamp. We only had access to the one day. Initially, we're going to get access one day each week for OTAs and minicamp. For me, Mustafer is a guy who stood out, not only with his size, but you know, watching him work with Marcus Dixon, the defensive line coach, and just reaction, right? Individual drills. How quick is his first step? You know, is he disciplined in terms of watching the ball move? Because yeah, they'll have the they'll have the stick with the ball in it. Once that moves, they move, and the coach will give a cadence, and he'll try to get them to jump off sides. So far, disciplined is what I've seen from Mustafer, but also Denver, I think, is banking on him as one of the undrafted guys that they're really pulling for and really hoping can stick with the Broncos and make the active roster this upcoming season. And look, he's gonna he's only one of two total Nittany Lions on the Broncos roster, joining KJ Hamler as well. So. For me, Broncos country, please keep an eye on Mustafer all throughout the offseason, throughout training camp, preseason. He's a guy that you need to keep your eyes on when the Broncos take the field. And look, Sarah, I think you know you and I have talked about this as well. He is a guy that Denver has to I, I, at least hope for. Like he for his size and despite his production at Penn State, he only had three sacks in his entire career. There, he can be an impact gap player, a two gap guy, which Denver needs plenty of those guys. They do, Cody, and I. they need more guys who evoke the Star Wars, you know, just get that going in me, right? <laughs> Darth Vader's castle is on Mustafar, so to have a player named Mustafar, that's close enough for me. I will take it. So, you know what, I, and I'm all for these guys, like like we talked about, PJ Mustafar, we've talked about other undrafted guys, potentially Art Green coming in at the cornerback position. Having these these veteran players ahead of them, having these position coaches like Marcus Dixon, Christian Parker, it's only going to benefit them in the long, even if they start off on the practice squad. We're, what have we learned the last handful of years? We're more likely than not to see these guys play at some point than we are not, right? If they make the practice squad, you're probably going to play at some point during the season. And you might just get called up. You, you might be on the practice squad. You might get called up to play week one, right? Because you can use the roster exemption and those types of things. So, these guys got to be ready. They've got to go out and maximize every snap. And I love that you like when you go out, you get one opportunity to, I guess, if you know the media is going to be there, right? And we know that the Broncos did that because of the whole gift card shenanigans with Sean Payton giving the PF Chang's $50 gift card to the rookie who said the least to the media. At least that's what Peter Schrager said on Good Morning Football was the story. These rookies know the media is going to be out there. So what do they do? They go out, they maximize that opportunity knowing that there's exposure. And I love that Mustafer did that and that he was able to, to shine as a defensive lineman in a practice where there's no pads. There's not really much contact, but you can show what you can do as, you know, timing the snap, being quick off the ball, those types of things. So it, it bodes well that these guys are making headlines this early on in the offseason. Broncos country, obviously the addition to the defensive line with Lancaster is big, but PJ Mustafer is a name you need to keep an eye on. We're going to continue our conversation here on Locked On Broncos. We're also going to talk about 
kicker. Who is an option? And could it be Brett Maher, who many of Broncos fans have shared their displeasure over? We'll talk about maybe why that's a little bit of a recency bias claim on today's episode of Lockdown Broncos. Real quick, need you to go check out the Lockdown Nuggets podcast because the Denver Nuggets are in their first ever NBA Finals. We don't know who they're playing just yet. It'll either be the Miami Heat or the Boston Celtics. But Adam Adams and Matt Moore have you covered with all the pick and roll action that you need with the Lockdown Nuggets podcast wherever you get your podcast and free on YouTube. After releasing Brandon McManus early on in the week, who might the Denver Broncos look toward for the kicker job here in 2023? Thank you so much, Broncos country, for tuning in, making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. Special shout out to all the everydayers out there who listen Monday through Friday, who watch Sunday through Thursday. We appreciate you so much for rocking with us here on Locked On Broncos. Let's continue our conversation on today's episode of the show, Sarah. Obviously, yesterday's episode, we broke down the news of Brandon McManus being released by the Broncos and maybe what it means for them going forward. Who could they look at? We threw out some potential names there, but the Broncos actually had a scheduled workout with Brett Maher, who formerly kicked for the Dallas Cowboys. And I think we should address the elephant in the room. When people think of Brett Maher, the only thing that they're thinking about right now is how he performed in the postseason. One of six from extra points. He had the yips and struggled to the point where we're all sitting there wondering, like, like, what's happening? And clearly it was a mental thing. But I also think that more recent exposure to Maher has kind of clouded the judgment from a lot of people, especially Broncos fans. When, you know, we put the tweet out there on social media talking about him and, you know, coming in for a workout. A lot of people said, no, absolutely not. We do not want this. But let's talk about like how he performed in the regular season because that's the overall bigger picture, bigger sample size body of work here for the Dallas Cowboys and maybe what he could bring to the table for the Broncos. Well, to say he was great in the regular season, I think would be a bit of an understatement, honestly, Cody. And that's this is not just us saying this because, oh, the Broncos are working this guy out. Let's find all the good things to say about him. No, we acknowledge that, you know, he struggled in the playoffs badly to the point that he's he remains unsigned. But Cody, there were only a handful of kickers in the entire NFL last year who made nine kicks from beyond 50 yards like Brett Maher did. He made nine out of 11 attempts, which was the best rate among, you know, any any kicker from beyond 50. But he also hit one from 60. So one of those one of those 50 plus kicks was a 60 yarder last season. He got one shot to kick from 60 plus last year or 60 on the dot and he made it. He made 8 out of 10 from 50 to 59. That's that's incredible. 90.6 field goal percentage on the season. So what we're what we're comparing this to right now is Brandon McManus, right? At 77.8% on the year last year. That ranked 30th in the league. Brett Maher was in the top 10, of course, in terms of field goal percentage at 90.6. So you're talking about going from a guy like McManus who did struggle from 40 and in and now getting a guy like Brett Maher who he's kicked for Sean Payton before. I believe, Cody, when he was with Sean Payton and the Saints back in 2021, he made over 86 percent or 88 percent of the kicks that he made there, 16 of 18, something like that. So he's kicked for Sean Payton before he he came into the league with the New York Jets back in 2013, which was. I was thinking, oh my gosh, this was like Mike Westoff's last hurrah, but it was they missed each other by just one year there with the New York Jets. So there are connections, though, obviously, with Sean Payton and being that he kicked last year for the Dallas Cowboys and kicked really well. I was approached by one of my Cowboys fan friends, Randy, who told me, hey, the playoffs were bad, but make no mistake, Brett Maher made a few game-winning kicks during the season as well. So he was clutch for them, 90.6% consistent. I think we'll take that, right, Broncos country? Yeah. That's what we need from the kicker position. Well, and I also think as well, right, you go through 50 of 53 from extra points in the regular season, you know, so really the playoffs were really an anomaly for him. And the fact that he made 50 extra points, I mean, hey, leading scorer there potentially for the Dallas Cowboys. But what stands out to me and how I always look at the metrics as well, I always think that your efficiency from 20 to 29, 30 to 39, and even your 40s, I think is important. So from 20 to 29, he was nine for nine last season. From 30 to 39, he was five for five. And then from 40 to 49, he was six of seven. And then as you mentioned, obviously the efficiency in terms of nine of 11 from 50 plus, like that is impressive. That's pretty damn good. That's better than what Brandon McManus was doing for the Broncos for the last two seasons. So I understand, yes, he had the yips in the playoffs in terms of extra points going one of six. Should that be applicable to maybe how he'll do 
in Denver, right? Obviously, if Sean Payton, you know, sees something in him, I think it's worth looking at. They're bringing him in for a workout, and if he does well, I mean, to be honest with you, sir, I would not be surprised if he signs, but I also would not be surprised as well as we're recording this. The workout is expected to happen. You know, we're recording this Wednesday morning. It's expected to happen on Wednesday in Dove Valley. So something for Broncos fans to keep an eye out for is Maher could be a good option. Don't let, you know, what happened in the playoffs cloud your judgment on the bigger picture. Yes, that was concerning in the playoffs. Is that going to be applicable to him for his entire career? I don't think so. It's not like a Cody Parkey situation that happened, obviously, with the uh, Chicago Bears in 2018. Uh, aside from all that, I do think Maher would be a solid option for them. We'll see if they bring anybody else in initially to you know evaluate in a potential kicking competition or maybe seeing what they want. Because I don't think that the Broncos make the move of releasing Brandon McManus without a plan or a vision in place. And look, after McManus was released, it was quick when we found out from Aaron Wilson, hey, the Broncos, they're planning on working out Brett Maher. So the ties that bind the former connection to Sean Payton, it all makes sense. And I, I think that, yeah, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt. If he is the kicker for Denver, give him the benefit of the doubt because his overall regular season, body of work, he has been a consistent kicker in the National Football League despite the playoff mishaps. He has. And what if people don't understand what you're talking about in terms of the yips, that's often used in terms of baseball pitchers, right? So baseball pitchers who are consistent, hitting the strike zone, getting guys out, you know, painting the edge, painting the corners, all of a sudden they just completely lose command, right? And so in baseball, what that's called, when a guy just simply can't throw strikes or he's throwing a bunch of meatballs up there, they call that a guy having the yips because he has lost his command. It's the similar thing happens to almost every NFL kicker. If you really pay attention, a lot of these guys, some of the best kickers in the league have had to go through a time where it's just like that overwhelming, uh, the, the mental stress that it must be to go out in front of, uh, tens of thousands of people and kick a ball through the uprights that mental stress can get to these guys but even the best of them like Daniel Carlson of the Raiders I would say he's probably one of the best kickers in the league does anybody even remember who he was drafted by he was drafted by the Minnesota Vikings remember how bad he was in his rookie season for the Vikings yeah. he got cut before the season was over the Raiders picked him up he's now one of the best kickers in the league that happened to Brandon McManus back in 2014. Remember, the Broncos had to have two kickers on the roster, Connor Barth being the other one, somebody who could actually make field goals and somebody like McManus who could just go out there and smack the ball through the end zone in terms of kickoff, being a kickoff specialist. So he struggled so badly kicking field goals, they had to do that. So that's what the yips means when you're talking about kickers is they just they don't have command of the accuracy at some points in time, it could happen at the beginning of a career. It could happen in the middle. It could happen near the end. One way or the other, I think you can expect these guys to kind of bounce back a little bit. So for Brett Maher, Cody, I wouldn't be worried about that. And I think he would be a great option for this team. Broncos country, let us know down below. If you're watching on YouTube, drop it in the comment section how you feel about Brett Maher, what you thought about today's episode of the show. If you're an everyday or commented as well. If you're listening, wherever you get your podcast, you can always tweet us at Cody Work NFL at Sarah Bettinger, at Lockdown Broncos. If you want to share your Broncos analysis with us, we value it. We appreciate you all who take time out here to listen or to watch us talk all things Denver Broncos. For all you everydayers out there, tomorrow's episode of the show, what happened during OTAs? We'll get we'll talk about that. I'll be at practice in the Valley on Thursday. We'll recap all the action, who was there, what were some of the biggest storylines. you get that much more on tomorrow's brand new episode, Lockdown Broncos.